Welcome everybody, I'm Joe Noriel, President of the Pelham Museum. So nice to see you guys here and thank you so much veterans for your service. Well here we are in our speaker series, uh, pretty exciting today, you know, when you think of the Korean War, uh, you may just think, well, 50 to 53 and then it was just over. Well, you know, fighting absolutely stopped, but the war never really officially ended, so that's why I'm really excited about our speaker here today to kind of give us an update on uh, current events over there in Korea. Uh, so. Our distinguished speaker, Major General Gary A. Vigi. He's a Deputy Commanding General of the 8th Army in Yongsan, Korea. An Army Reserve Brigadier General has participated in war games in South Korea to prepare for an invasion or the collapse of the North Korean government. Mr. McVigi. Thank you. So, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for, for coming. You know, there are some seats in the middle and in the front, if you want to move around. Otherwise, I have to keep walking from the side to the side to look at everybody. But it's up to you. I know people are sometimes shy to take the front seat. Can't see it. I, let me just tell you a little bit uh, more about myself so you know where my perspective is. I'm local. I live between uh, Petaluma and Sebastopol out in the county on Schaefer Road. I'm a reservist. And I've been a reservist uh, for quite some time now. I am now assigned as the Deputy Commanding General uh, for 8th Army. I've been going back and forth to Korea for about 15 plus years uh, in different capacities. I've been in units that have been regionally aligned with the Pacific and uh, most specifically Korea. Uh, so going back and forth for exercises, I was on a targeting board with the Air Force uh, for a while and did some off-exercise uh, work as well. So I'm one in your community, I'm here with you, and I've had about 30 years in the service, both uh, active uh, and reserve, mainly focus on civil affairs uh, and psychological operations. In the beginning of my career, I was a judge advocate. I noticed that the brass on the enlisted uniform around the, the side was from the judge advocate. So I've had a varied career, mainly focused in Korea on the civilian dimension there. Now, I see a wide range of ages here. So I don't know uh, what you know about Korea. I'm not going to go into a history of Korea. I was asked really to give you an update and what, what's going on there now. But I do want to touch on some points that I think are important to understand the context of Korea. Uh, and I do thank the uh, staff of, of the museum here as well as all the people from Petaluma for having these events. You know, other than uh, those Vietnam vets that were very badly treated uh, after their service, Korean war vets are probably next in line for being uh, ignored not uh, congratulated, not uh, thanked for the, the service they gave to their uh, country. Many had given service not only in World War II and then continued on and, and went on uh, to the Korean War, War, which wasn't that much uh, after the cessation of hostilities in World War II. So I want to just give you a couple of political points following on that comment. World War II drained America. People were tired of war, they were happy with peace, and they wanted to demobilize forces as quickly as they could, not only in the European theater, but also in the Pacific theater as well. Korea was a, a small portion of the, the overarching context of what our president uh, and the tri tripartite uh, Stalin and Churchill what they were considering. Their biggest concern was with Russia and, uh, and Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, but also Asia, but to a much lesser extent. Huge political questions, uh, what would happen to Japan, and as you know, Japan had colonized Korea uh, in the early 1900s, and Korea was an occupied nation under Korea, <coughs> under Japanese rule. So it wasn't until the liberation of Korea by uh, U.S. forces, combined forces, and the, the U.N. command that was operating there, uh, that Korea 
had the opportunity to be a unified country again. It has a proud history, you know, going back thousands of years, fighting off the hordes as a unified country. And they had been arbitrarily split. Now, at one point, they thought they wanted to fight. East Germany and Berlin have a number, number of occupying powers. They actually considered that for Japan and Korea as well. Uh, that did not happen, ultimately, in Japan. Uh, but Korea, it was ar arbitrarily split the 38th parallel. It, there really was no political will uh, to fight um, and, or continue fighting in that region following World War II. So going into the beginning of hostilities with the, the North communist government uh, running over uh, the, the border, just pouring over. And you've heard probably about Chinese masses. They fought the battles uh, by just sending hordes of infantry and tanks south. Uh, I want, I noticed a number of good books here. I want to uh, refer one uh, to you. If you want to read what it was like for an infantryman to fight that war from the beginning, it was a full colonel, uh, General Peck, P-A-I-K, was on the border when the Chinese and North Koreans came south. He ended up fighting south to the Pusan perimeter. And again, I'm not going to go in, I'm just hitting some big facts here. Fought all the way back to the Pusan perimeter. He was a division commander as an 06 uh, colonel when the, uh, the war began. Fought all the way back, became a uh, Corps commander and later an army commander. So by the end of 1953, he was a four star general in the Korean army. The only four star general, the first four star general, uh, later the chief of staff, uh, later became an ambassador uh, for Korea in several countries. Uh, he is alive today. And I got to meet him a few months ago. And he gave me a copy of his book, which I promptly read. And he describes it from a Korean perspective, a Korean infantry perspective, uh, what the relationship was with the U.S., but also what it was like to fight for your country and its survival. The Republic of Korea, South Korea, at all times wanted to unify, wanted to be one country. But we were so uh, close in time to the end of World War II, uh, the political will was not there to do anything but fight basically a stalemate, although we could have done quite a bit more and a lot of controversy with, with General uh, MacArthur and uh, what he wanted to do up north. Uh, I'm not going to get into those issues. But the political will was not there. And, and I, I saw the signs here. And you know how far it is. It's, it's an 11-hour flight from San Francisco Korea. It's about a 14 day boat trip. It's a long way. So to resource uh, that fight was a tremendous fight. It's about twice as far as to Europe. So to support a, an ongoing battle, to make, uh, to basically drive the uh, North Koreans uh, farther north, to drive the Chinese out, was just something our country wasn't willing to do, although the Republic of Korea at all times did not want to end the fighting. They did not want to settle on the 38th parallel. That was forced on them, uh, basically, uh, by the Chinese, Russians, and the U.S. Now, that war has never ended. People have never, don't have a sense of that. It's an armistice. You've probably heard that term. Now, 8th Army, where uh, I belong, um, one of two deputy commanding generals there, as a reservist, I travel quite a bit there. 8th Army is the biggest, uh, it is the highest command for the United States Army. So we own all the subordinate Army commands. Uh, we have about, and I'm going to give you rough numbers, and there are some areas that where I will be vague because of classifications, uh, meaning whether it's classified information or not. I, I will be happy to answer all your questions at the end as long as I don't get into those 
uh, areas as well. But so I belong to the command that uh, is, is the Army's component for fighting uh, the war. Uh, and for right now, it's deterring the North. That's one of our primary missions is to be there, show our solidarity, work shoulder to shoulder with the Republic of Korean Army, which is one of the most professional armies in the world, to show our solidarity. We have two very large exercises, in fact, two of the biggest in the world, twice a year. And that's been going on for decades. In part, not only to be ready in case they come south again, but mainly to deter, because the North knows every time we have that exercise, uh, we have a, roughly about 28,500 on the in Korea, the Republic of Korea, another 38,000 or so in Japan, Guam, elsewhere. So we have a lot of troops in the region. Uh, you add in the Navy, and the Navy comes to the exercises as well. So we have a very large, what we would call a show of force twice a year uh, to deter the government up north. Now, let me tell you about the government up north a little bit. It is a Stalinist-style regime to the nth degree. Uh, basically, you know, the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, they also have very uh, tenuous relations with the Soviets now. Uh, the Chinese government and other communist government certainly supports and is a good conduit uh, with the <coughs> North Korean government. However, it is an extremely isolated government. Uh, big differences between the Korean War and today is that China, China uh, the Soviet Union, the Republic of Korea, which has one of the most industrialized and strongest economies in the world today. You see Samsung, Hyundai, and they're uh, just have a great and robust industrialized nation. But China and Russia, Japan, they are all huge trading partners with one another. They are economically dependent. That wasn't true back in 1950. So the, the support by the Chinese and the Russians of the North Koreans isn't nearly uh, as strong or the same as it was back in 1950. Now, the, the Republic of Korea, I mentioned, is an extremely uh, robust, industrialized, a democratic nation, they're going to have elections again uh, this December, just like we are uh, this November. They have about 50 million uh, people. It's about the size of Kentucky. It would basically fit uh, in between San Jose and Reading. Uh, North Korea is just uh, slightly larger, about the size of Pennsylvania, as far as uh, square miles. So it's a fairly small, uh, compact two states side by side. Now the 50 million people in the Republic of Korea compares to about 25 million in the North. Uh, the North has had uh, droughts and mass starvation off and on for the last several decades. Even I know what I've seen in North Korea. I've met a number of uh, people who have fled and then, uh, then come into the system to be questioned. Uh, they are noticeably different. They're noticeably smaller. Uh, the whole population, they believe, has lost some of their uh, intelligence, their IQ, uh, because of the starvation that's impacted the younger uh, generations. Almost all the food resources they have go to the ruling party and the army, which is one of the largest in the world. Uh, the Republic of Korea has about 600,000 uh, in their uh, armed services, uh, about another 3 million uh, in reserves. They have mandatory conscription there. Every, every uh, male has to serve two years. It's part of service to their country. So they have a very robust military. Uh, the North, again, has one of the largest armies, largest militaries in the world. They have, uh, as you know, nuclear weapons. They detonated their first in 2004. They have a Soviet style of warfare with artillery 
massive amounts of artillery located right on their southern border, the demilitarized zone, the DMZ. Now, the greatest population center in the Republic of Korea is Seoul. It had been its royal capital from thousands of years ago. It is the heart and center, Seoul of, of uh, Korea. 25 million people in the greater Seoul area. Seoul itself is larger than New York City. And if you haven't been there in a few years, I, every time I go there, there's a new bridge being built over the Han River. Uh, it's incredible how much construction and growth. They just built a canal from Seoul to Incheon uh, for shipping. It is huge. 25 million people from Seoul to the northern border. All within artillery range, long range artillery of the North Koreans. So, you can imagine, so think of the context of that. If you have nuclear, chemical, biological weapons that are weaponized and able to be uh, fired either in ballistic missiles or long range uh, rockets or artillery, all can range into a place like New York City. So if hostilities were to resume again, it could absolutely be a deplorable bloodbath, even with conventional weapons being used. So that's what the Republic of Korea faces. That's what we face uh, at Eighth Army at being the deterrent uh, to reinitiation of hostilities. Now, what, does anyone know what happened? It's now almost two years ago. Okay, number one, the, there's a regime change going on in the north. The dear one died. His young son has taken over, really young, in his 20s. No one knows, and that, that process will take years uh, to see if politically he'll be accepted in the north. Now, one of the things culturally and politically they do when they're having a regime change is they flex their muscles to show that they're in command and control of their army and their military force. What happened early on with uh, Kim Jong-un coming into power as he was being eased into power, is a, a sinking of a ship, a South Korean ship, an act of war. Over 40 Republic of Korea sailors were killed as that ship was torpedoed. An absolute act of war, which in any other context would have resumed hostilities immediately. A sinking of a ship and loss of life. Within the same year, there was an artillery barrage. They really don't know how many artillery rounds were fired, but about 70 impacted one of the islands, just to the west off Incheon, Northwest Islands, killing four, to, uh, to uh, Marines for the Republic of Korea, to civilians, damaging about and destroying about 15 homes. But about 70 to 90, approximately, artillery rounds hit, hit the island. Uh, they think as many as 170 were fired and the remainder going off into the ocean. About 30 rounds were fired in return and none of them uh, were deliberately aimed as counter, what we call counter battery fire to uh, go steel on steel, artillery to artillery to put uh, an end. And it was pretty much after the artillery barrage was over by the North that the South finally responded. Those two events saw a number of very senior Republic of Korea generals relieved, up to the highest level, chief of staff, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff equivalent, all relieved and replaced. Now, over the last two decades, there's been different uh, engagements politically by the South, liberal, uh, more of what they call a sunshine policy. The Southern government was trying to, you know, by aid, trade, uh, building a railroad and, uh, and joint industrial area, trying to rebuild relations with the North. That was replaced by an extremely hardline government. And the government today has basically said, one more provocation like that, and 
were back in the fight. So you have the military uh, very much been cleansed in the South uh, because of their failure to robustly defend the nation and a hardline government. Now, I understand that this December there's a, another presidential election and the only, most of the, can, uh, there are three main candidates and they are all leaning towards a more liberal sunshine <coughs> policy again. And you can understand why they just can't risk a resumption of war because of the mass, uh, massive casualties that can be expected. Let me give you another part. So Iraq, drawn down. Afghanistan, we're drawn down. Uh, one of the things that we have learned from both of those conflicts uh, throughout the Pacific, which covers most of the planet, most people, you know, they look at a globe, they don't really picture how big the Pacific is. It's huge. And there's some of the largest Muslim populations, some of the largest armies, terrorist organizations, and wide open ocean. So one of the lessons we have learned is to engage early on to prevent uh, the building, and we've been fighting for quite some time, if you weren't aware, in the Philippines, pretty much won that battle against extremist uh, terrorists, Al-Qaeda-like Al -Qaeda -like affiliates uh, throughout the Pacific. So as we downsize in Central Command, Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, Yemen, Syria, Iran, all in CENTCOM, the uh, stated, and this has been publicly stated by our Secretary of Defense as well as our Commander-in-Chief, that we are going to now wait the effort in the Pacific. So there's a buildup going on in the Pacific for engagement. So 8th Army is the, boot, the boots on the ground on the Korean Peninsula to show our resolve and solidarity uh, with the Republic of Korea government and armed forces. We are building it up. Now just since this uh, armistice, 8th Army had been the war fighting corps and then army uh, in Korea. It really was taking on an army role as a, basically just a support role for the 2nd Infantry Division, the bits and pieces of the uh, combat pieces that were in theater. So really since 53, the operational maneuver army was transformed into an administrative function. That has changed as of January this year. So 8th Army was reflagged as a, a war fighting uh, a field army once again. And we really only have one of them uh, in the uh, army right now. Uh, so we have a much different role than in the last 50 years and a much different role for uh, the size of our force uh, than any of the other field armies remaining in the inventory uh, of the Army. We have another brand new mission to form, if hostilities were to resume, uh, to form a task force, a combined joint task force with the Republic of Korea, with all services, Air Force, Marines, Navy, uh, will join with the Army and to form an 8th Army Task Force. And I can't tell you what that mission is, but it's a robust, uh, broad spectrum, uh, meaning very wide-ranging conventional capability uh, in Korea. So that is happening right now, where our staff is transforming. Uh, we have basically uh, had a, a small force in place on the peninsula, 2nd Infantry Division lost one of its brigades. When it went to uh, Iraq, it never came back. It was restationed. Um, there are no other uh, active component divisions. Let me throw in a little bit here too. My daughter, I just commissioned her she, uh, at back in May. She's in her officer basic course right now. Her first duty assignment will be Korea. So she's um, going to be a field artilleryman. She'll be in one of the best fires brigade in the country. Uh, our, our, our Army's uh, fire brigades is, and the absolute best is in Korea. She's going to be joining that. As part of the uh, experiment with women in direct support of uh, combat at the battalion level. 
So I have a personal, besides myself going back and forth, my daughter's probably going to be there in February or March uh, next year. So we are restructuring our command structure to prepare ourselves for this other mission, not only the field army operational mission, the operating force mission, but also this formation of a combined joint task force. Uh, more force structure is coming. Uh, most of the military construction in the world for the Army is in Korea. Right now, building new bases farther south off the DMZ. We have traditionally been right up on the border together with the Republic of Korea. Uh, we're moving, we're consolidating back. One, just as we do in our, have done in our own country, trying to have a smaller footprint for posts and stations. Um, RAC, the Base Realignment Act, if, you, if you've heard of that here for the U.S., which caused us to lose almost everything in the, in the Bay Area to go to be relocated. Same thing's going on in the Republic of Korea. They want, you know, our headquarters is at Yongsan right now. It's, a, it's a, right in the heart of Seoul. It'll make a great park one day. And uh, the Seoul uh, the city government, as well as the, the, uh, the national government, wants that land back. Uh, so we'll have a little resort uh, left there, uh, but all of that army base where I now my, have my headquarters uh, will become a park. So that's a, a normal realignment, but there's, so there will be efficiencies in supporting our uh, soldiers, airmen, marines there. Uh, but we are uh, seeing most of, most, with that, throughout the world, the most construction is going on in Korea right now, which the Republic of Korea is mainly paying for. Uh, they pay for most of our presence there. So as, ex as expensive as this sounds, uh, the Republic of Korea is uh, footing uh, a lot of the bill. We absolutely do everything together with them. And as I said in the beginning, they have become very professionalized. Uh, if you heard about their special operators off the coast in Somalia, uh, taking down um, some pirated plant, uh, ships and uh, relieving some captives there. They did as good a job as our Navy SEALs did. Uh, they have been in Iraq. They were in Vietnam with us. They've been in Afghanistan. Uh, they've been participating in other exercises off the Korean Peninsula. So our land forces, we build it in Korea, in the 8th Army, uh, will be capable of going off the peninsula in case there's a contingency elsewhere. By contingency, something happens, whether it's a national disaster or an armed conflict with some other nation. Uh, as you also know, I kind of overlaid some of the political and diplomatic things that have been going on there. Uh, China's been throwing a lot more domestic product into the building up their uh, projection, force projection capability in their Navy and Air Force. You know, we have a, a resolute agreement with Taiwan. <coughs> Vietnam now is looking for us to partner with them, if you haven't been reading that, uh, because, uh, and Philippines are wanting us back in more numbers. We've built bases on northern Australia. The Chinese are starting to uh, flex in, in those seas just to the west of Korea and to the south, then Philippines and Vietnam, pretty much the whole region is feeling threatened by uh, the Chinese growth of its offensive capability militarily. So uh, we fit into a broader mix other than just to deter uh, the North Koreans from coming south. Time will tell what will happen, hopefully uh, there will be reunification, that is a stated goal, under peaceful terms. Uh, but quite frankly, there is no nation, including China and, uh, and Russia, that really speaks with a convincing voice to the North Korean government. They are completely isolated, have been for quite some time, and really don't listen to anyone. And it's very hard uh, to penetrate to really get good intelligence on what they may or may not do in the future. You know about the rocket launches, the ballistic missile launches. Uh, they had planned another nuclear test that has been delayed. 
uh, and the international community has been quite forceful in trying to constrain uh, their activities. So it's a very complicated situation that is an absolute powder keg if it was to light off again would result in mass casualties potentially on both sides. Uh, obviously the South is much more industrial, much more capable, much more professional army and Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, especially when joined with the uh, U.S. government, we have a consortium of other nations that also participate in the defense of the South. Up north, with, you know, they have half the population. Uh, their, all of their industrial base has pretty much been run into the ground. Uh, they mainly have illicit arms trades, money laundering, uh, other illicit uh, transactions with other nations. They, they don't play by normal trade rules, and nor do they produce anything that's readily exportable to any other nation. So the South certainly is capable of taking uh, over. We have had the lead. We have always had the lead, and that has been transitioning. We would have already transitioned to be in support of the ROC military. Uh, that was supposed to have happened in 2012. But because of the Chenan uh, sinking, the ship that was sunk, and the Waipedo artillery barrage, where the, uh, most of their leadership was relieved and new leadership put in place between the, the U.S. government and the, uh, so between our, both of our presidents, they basically agreed to slow down uh, the transition of power or transition of who's supporting whom. So we're targeting 2015 right now to come out from under the lead and hand the lead back uh, to the uh, Korean military forces. So we're beginning to exercise that now with them in the lead. Now I've talked quite a bit, and I, I have a lot of very serious looks on everyone's faces. I want to make sure I have time for questions. So let me let me turn over to questions now, so I can hit areas in any any area at all that you may have questions that I may not have touched upon. Yes, sir. What is the defection rate from north to south? Then? I can't give you a rate, but I will tell you with the advent, you know, they have no internet there. Can you believe that? <laughs> I mean, no internet. But with the advent of cell phones <laughs> that have been smuggled in, that has facilitated people fleeing north into China and then ex coming back down around and into the Republic of Korea. And they have family. You know, General Peck that I talked about in the beginning of this uh, grew up in Pyongyang. He's never seen his family there since the arbitrarily uh, drawn 38 parallels put in place. I th there's a, a vast number. It is, it is increasing. Uh, and it has mainly been facilitated with the ability to call and get some help through um, black market cell phone use. So I can't give you numbers, but I can tell you uh, the, there's quite a, quite a fit, fit pouring north and either staying in China or if they have the wherewithal and the support with family in the south uh, coming over <coughs> to the Republic of Korea. Yes, sir. Would it be to North Korea's advantage to invade the South again? And if, if they did so, what do you think China and or Russia would do? That's the $3 million question. Yeah. Uh, well, I will, so first of all, I, I don't think either side wants to resume war, especially under the context. I mean, people over the last uh, 20 years around the world have recognized that the U.S., Military is the strongest military in the world, bar none. We will very, very quickly uh, dominate the seas, east and west. Its peninsula comes down. Our navy is far superior uh, than their navy, especially combined with the Republic of Korea and Australian and British forces that would join us. Our air force would completely dominate the airspace very quickly. Uh, I don't think there's any rational government that would want to take us on. And that's why we show our solidarity with these exercises very robustly twice not, a year. They know rational. that we're there. They're not uh, rational. Boy. Well, and so totally that's, uh, you know, we saw, you know, I lived the Cold War, and 
when I was on active duty in full the gap during uh, the height of the Cold War. You know, we, uh, we really gave a lot more credibility, I think, to Soviet forces and Soviet satellite forces once they finally collapsed and we saw with their bases and equipment the shape that it was in. We were surprised at how hollow it was. <coughs> to some extent, I, ex I expect and suspect that North Korean's force, as large as it is, is poorly equipped, manned, trained. Uh, I, they can't win. And uh, the, as bloody as the fight would be, uh, I don't think they would rationally start. But the irrational part of it is the part we can't guess on. And that's why we have to be prepared uh, to be able to suppress that if they start up with all the long range uh, artillery, ballistic missiles and artillery firing into the greater Seoul metropolitan area, we have to be able to suppress that, shut it down as quickly as possible to save lives in uh, South Korean lives. So I, you know, I'm very confident we would overwhelm them very quickly. I think they know that. So we're hopeful that we have deterred them. We have so far, other than these rogue acts of war that have occasionally happened. And there have been shooting, cross-border shootings for the last 50 years, uh, some murders in the demilitarized zone, small, smaller engagements, acts of violence, tunnels drilled under the border. You've heard about those. I've been in them. They exist. Uh, we're constantly trying to find them if they're still building them. Uh, but they've, uh, they've had small submarines, a very large soft force, special operating force. They use that uh, to create a counterinsurgency at the end of the Korean War um, before the armistice was signed. We think they've really put a lot of emphasis on their soft forces. So boats, mini submarines, people already infiltrated south uh, to create little uh, uh, teams to operate, create confusion in the south. We think that'll be a, a large part of the fight. But we are very confident we have been able to deter them, and we hope to do so, so that there's a peaceful political settlement and solution to this eventually. Yes, please. You said they were very isolated. Which country are they closest with? It? I, China. You know, the Soviets had a, a larger uh, relationship years ago, but China has remained engaged. Uh, their biggest trade between each other is China and North Korea, China and Japan, China and the Republic of Korea. But China has. Uh, you know, they've entertained, they took a visit from uh, the new leader. Uh, some of his relatives are living in China. Uh, quite frankly, uh, whether good or bad, but certainly a point to highlight, there's, there's a huge Chinese population in the Republic of Korea. Uh, you know, hundreds of thousands. Uh, so China's the closest by far, and we, we certainly hope and press the Chinese government in any any time there's a threatened rocket launch or, or a nuclear test, uh, some provocation or act that could be perceived as a provocation. You know, our, our diplom public diplomacy really uh, tries to get China to live up to their responsibility. It's their part of the region. And Beijing's less than 600 miles away from Seoul. That's, they're, they're very close. They're contiguous. The border of North Korea and, and China Mainly, there's a small sliver of, of Russia off to the right, uh, off to the east. But yeah. uh, as some think, some political analysts don't know that the Chinese government actually has the kind of clout we're hopeful that they have. Uh, you know, we sometimes blame them for not doing more, but they may be doing as much as they can. And uh, Pyongyang, which is the capital of the North, just isn't listening. So it's very complicated. We don't know what we don't know as far as the politics between those countries. Good press. Yes, sir. Uh, General, you mentioned putting bases further south, possibly. Wouldn't that be like on the east coast down as far as Pohang? Uh, or Camp Tegu? Humphreys. Uh, do you know where Osan is? Yes, it's right south of Osan. I was there, there a week ago. There's huge construction going on. You know, we still have um, large uh, infrastructure in Daegu that we will keep. So we're really just closing mo most of those installations in the second infantry division area, just south of the MDL, the uh, demilitarized zone, shifting those forces 
like, like primarily Second Infantry Division and some of the uh, anti-aircraft uh, down to the Camp Humphreys area, which is just south of Osun. Right. And there's other bases as well, but that's the primary construction project right now. It's two years behind. How about on the East Coast, like down towards Poang or Busan? Well, you know, a lot of the port areas, uh, Busan, all going to remain because clearly, you know, if hostilities were to resume, those points, uh, the, not only the airheads, but the naval uh, ports will be crucial to bringing not only forces to the, uh, to the peninsula, but supplies and also non-combatant evacuation. You know, we have uh, quite, uh, I can't give you the number, quite a large number of not only U.S., but U.S. friendly citizens of third countries that we have to get out of harm's way. And that, so you can, you know, those intersections coming out and going in, uh, you know, all those heads, railheads, and shipyards, and airheads will all be over -tasked. If you look at some of these photographs, look very closely. Look at that. There's a map. I saw one map anyway. Actually, there's one there, and there's one in the glass case. Look at it carefully. Look at the terrain. There's very, what we call, small avenues of approach. It is some of the most mountainous, rugged terrain. You know, high mountains, very narrow valleys, which makes it very hard to maneuver. It makes it very hard to evacuate people. It makes it very hard to bring relief to dislocated uh, civilians. Uh, it's awful terrain. Uh, it's very hard, harsh climate, and you've certainly heard about that in summer time. It's really hot and terribly humid. In the winter, it's terribly damp and frigid, and the winds blow, and the train is miserable. It's not a place to fight a war. Uh, those that fought there, uh, fought in some of the worst conditions our Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force has ever fought. Yes, sir. One more question. Uh, a year ago, the Marines were thinking about taking about 8,000 people and moving to Guam. I understand now it's down to about 3,000. Is that correct? A lot of politics involved in that, but uh, yeah. and I, I thought the numbers were kind of settling in the more in the four to 4,500 uh, region. I don't know what what's going to happen with that basing, but we do have Marines in Guam, which is also uh, part of our sphere of uh, ready forces, uh, if anything should happen. Uh, but a lot of politics involved uh, with the respective governments and costs involved in building bases. Uh, but I don't, I don't know what number they finally settled on. Yes, sir. There was a considerable period of time after the Second World War where the South Koreans and the Japanese uh, were not particularly friendly toward each other. Has that changed? No, sir. Uh, have you, uh, did you watch the Olympics at all? <laughs> okay, what, there's, there's some rocks, so I wouldn't even call them islands, but now I can't remember if it was the president or prime minister, someone from the Republic of Korea government visited those rocks. They're, cla they're claimed by both Japan and Korea. One of the, the soccer team players held up a sign referring to that visit, which had just occurred. Uh, to that barren rock, the spit of a land. Uh, he didn't get his medal, and he was basically sent home. And it was a big public outcry. Big tit for tat between uh, the Republic of Korea and Japan over those contested rocks. Now, the other thing that come, persists uh, from well, not only from their occupation, Japan's occupation, but you know, there was a period of time when comfort girls were basically kidnapped. You know, Korean women were kidnapped and uh, used by uh, the Japanese army for illicit purposes. The Japanese <coughs> government has never formally apologized for that. That's something that the Republic of Korea government has demanded every year. Uh, and so there's still some, there's still some hard feelings there. You know, and I, I know we're taping this, but uh, you know, everywhere I've been as a soldier, 
if I had been in a place where the Soviet Union had been before me at some point in history, everyone there hated the Soviet Union because they were so hard on the local population. Absolutely the same thing with the Japanese. Wherever the Japanese occupied, they were just horrific to the local uh, That's a 45 year occupation. Pardon? That was a long <coughs> occupation. So I think there's still is some some headway to be made. They are in talks. Uh, when when we do engage in different, uh, not only economic uh, summits, but also summits on regional security, uh, the Japanese are certainly one of our best allies, and they are included. Uh, so they are talking. Uh, they're they bonded uh, in many ways, but there is a, there's a little bit of friction that still needs residual historical friction that needs to be cleared up. Just as an aside, uh, I have spoken to a number of uh, rocks uh, who served during the war, and I had asked them a question. I said, what would have happened if the Japanese sent over troops to help the South Koreans fight the North Koreans? The, the comment invariably was, we would stop fighting the North Koreans and we turn out. I don't know if it's quite that bad today, I should hope uh, but that may have been uh, many years ago uh, a sense of pride to say something like that. You know, and the Japanese uh, are in the process of transforming from a purely defensive force to a more uh, offensive capability, which is something I think uh, our military supports because they are such a good ally and a very important, uh, robust, industrialized nation in that region. So, I, you know, it's better not to focus on the past uh, and those friction points, and I, and I don't think the same holds true today. And quite frankly, if uh, there was a humanitarian crisis, as the Japanese uh, did experience, uh, the uh, Republic of Korea was there to be a friend, uh, as we were. Uh, if the reverse were true, and certainly we have a lot of uh, force staging, uh, as well as non-combat evacuation that would go through Japan, Japan would absolutely be an essential and key friend to the Republic of Korea, whether a humanitarian crisis had ensued or some kind of conflict had resumed. So I'm very confident that they will play well together uh, when they need to. How about some more? Are you guys here for a homework assignment? Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, so what's your um, next question? Would you describe the military spending on American forces in Korea to be a, a little bit of an overkill or an underkill? I would say it's neither. Well, one point that I would make is, uh, one, and I already made it, the, Re the Republic of Korea is funding a lot of our infrastructure. Uh, they pay for a lot that goes on there, as well as we're sending over a, a lot of new equipment uh, and equipment from that came out of Iraq. Uh, in the military right now, especially with the presidential election coming up and not knowing what's going to happen with sequestration, I will tell you, it's a very unknown time for whether we're the Department of Defense as a whole, not just the Army, not just Korea, but everywhere in the world, uh, what will happen to the budget. Because it's supposed to slash considerably at a time when we're looking at a ticking time bomb in our Iran, you know, Syria's really a mess. Yemen's been a mess. Pakistan's been a mess. You know, we still have an awful lot going on. So budgeting, you know, where our government puts its money, whether, and obviously we've been hurting domestically. I just talk to your parents if you don't sense it yourself. Uh, domestically, we need some rebuilding uh, ourselves. So uh, I can't tell you it's underspent or overspent, since I'm there, I want more stuff. I want more people, I want you know, our artillery rounds to come in and be replaced with new stuff. You know, we, we constantly want more because it adds to the deterrent. You know, what, what is really well spent? You know, the money that we spent there over the, since, the, since the armistice was signed in 53, you know, it may have saved many millions of lives because we've prevented the, the fight from reoccurring. Does that stabilize that whole region? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Does that allow free trade with China and Japan, the Republic of Korea? 
yes, you know, we had those nice tablets, and cell phones by Samsung and Hyundai and Kia. You know, they're some of the uh, biggest shipbuilders in the world. You know, if there was a war, a resumption of war there, instability there, all of that would be gone, especially at a time when the economy is so fragile globally. You know, something like that kicking off again. What would that, you know, where's the value of the money in deterring uh, another war there? So, do we have it right? I think it's probably as close uh, to where we should be in the amount of funding, uh, amount of funding that is expended not only up on the Grand Peninsula but around it. Um, will that change? We'll see what happens with the budget. Uh, but that's for Americans to decide. That's for our commander in chief uh, to, dis to decide. I think it's money well spent to deter uh, aggression up in the north and keep uh, the peace, which we have successfully done. Yes, sir. Do we still have uh, U.S. troops on the DMZ? And do we have Eighth Army Rear established? Yes. Both of them. We uh, uh, obviously, I, I will tell you, it's surreal going up there. And I'll just describe it for those who haven't been there. Again, think big mountains, narrow roads, passageways. Once, as you get closer and closer to the north, number one, the DMZ is the, among, if not the most heavily mined areas in the world. In fact, scientists are hoping to get back in there because it's been untouched by humans uh, for that period of time. So wildlife and far and far have just been flourishing. Heavily mined. Coming down those narrow roadways, you will see cement pillars erected on the sides. And you will see that they have charges in them, ready to cut those arteries in case the north came south. You will see many encampments, mostly Republic of Korea, uh, but the 2nd Infantry Division is still in the same positions they've been there pretty much all along. But they are at fixed bayonet. They are on point, on guard, they are alert. Um, the tunnels that I talked about, they are monitored and blocked. Uh, it is a high state of alert. Uh, our forces are there, but again, you know, they have 48, the Republic of Korea have 48 divisions. I think we're down to eight globally. Yes, sir. sir. Uh, is there any reason to believe that the North Koreans think that we wouldn't use tactical nuclear weapons if they came south? You know, that's an area that I really can't speak to at all. I'm sorry, I should have asked. No, that's okay. But, uh, Certainly, from any laypersons. I mean, that and that talking was the whole about war issue. The whole well, time. and ha as I began this presentation, kind of talking about how we were ending up closing out World War II. What was the, the last big decision Truman was making was the use of the two atomic bombs. I mean, that's been debated whether that was the right or wrong thing ever since. Uh, and there's a period of time during that, uh, from its use until the Russians came up with them, where you know. The United States was the only nuclear armed country. Uh, that has dramatically changed. And Let me rephrase that. How about yes, if we had thought a uh, tactic, a uh, regular World War II kind of conflagration? Uh, uh, do we have the logistical support in place to support something and go 15 days? Or? Uh, again, that yes. And I, I would say that our plans are in place. Uh, the Republic of Korea, again, is it's one of the largest economies in the world, mm -hmm. and they've been they've been well prepared not only for humanitarian, medical, foodstuffs, as well as supplies. Now there are some shortages that are being remedied right now um, in areas of uh, without specifics. Some munitions that are that are in short supply there. You know the. 12 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan has drained some of uh, the Air Force's munitions particularly. You know, they've been all focused on CENTCOM. But I, I am very confident that uh, between the Republic of Korea, 
all of the allied nations that are part of the UN command, as well as the US, has a plan in place uh, to resupply, exfiltrate uh, non-combatants. You know, we're, we're ready uh, to do the best we can, as much as we can. Could do. That's the only thing that will hold them off, is they got to believe that we're ready to pounce on them, perhaps, otherwise they well, again, we do these two exercises. Young people over there are doing the kinds of things, dumb things I have. <laughs> yeah, again, the tyranny of distance makes those supply lines hard. Uh, but again, we have good friends with Japan and other allied nations in the region. Uh, we do these two exercises, the largest in the world, twice a year. Uh, the North, I mean, they have it. They're seeing it twice a year. They see us doing it. They know we're there and uh, robustly exercising. Yes, sir. Do you expect either China or Russia to provide soft support bases for the you know, to go up to the first war? Yeah, I, it's a very different economic situation. And uh, quite frankly, I think people are surprised at how capitalistic China has become. You know, uh, communism and capitalism didn't necessarily go hand in hand 50 years ago. So it's a, it's a different dynamic relationship between those countries. Uh, I, I cannot speculate as to what China or Russia would do. The point you have to consider though, that's your southern border. This is really the last relic, the last place on earth the last vestige of the Cold War. And so China and Russia probably enjoy that buffer between uh, a, a democratic government and their communist governments. Uh, so they want, it, they want it to remain in place. They want the status quo. Uh, so what they would do in, if, in support of a hostility, uh, I really don't know. I, I would speculate that it wouldn't be nearly as direct. You know, they had, uh, and you'll hear from the pilots, the fighter pilots who may have come across a couple of mates uh, with Soviet pilots in there. Uh, certainly the Chinese threw hordes of, of their population, their, their, uh, their soldiers into the fight. I don't think that would happen again. One other follow-up. Uh, there was a report in the paper the other day that there's an association in South Korea that's going to release the balloons to, into North Korea with the PSYOPs type uh, athletes of the Infant Congress. I mean, Kim Jong Un has said we're going to retaliate uh, viciously if that takes place. Does the South Korean government have any control over those associations or is it confidenced by the South Korean government? Or? Okay, some of that is an area where I cannot speak. Uh, certainly, they have their own PSYOP forces that had, had ceased not only broadcast across the DMZ, these huge arrays, you want to hear something surreal, you hear these huge loudspeakers broadcast, and they stopped that for a good period of time. They have their own balloon capability, which they had stopped, you know, going into the north. And I will tell you, most of what was sent, and it wasn't really propaganda, although it's a form of propaganda, but it was household humanitarian goods, from soap uh, to uh, CDs, to kind of give them a taste of what movies and music, was, you know, the culture uh, in the South. Uh, certainly, the North can consider those acts of war. Now, these non-governmental organizations uh, that have been doing the balloons, and, and let me also say that, you know, the winds are not favorable very often to go from south to north and with any expectation that they're not going to get blown over to Japan or out to the ocean. Uh, so they don't have very many good windows of opportunity to even do the balloons. Um, I, I cannot tell you what, uh, how much authority or uh, deliberateness there is between the Republic of Korean government and these non-governmental organizations, some of which are religious-based, um, to engage the north. Uh, so I, I, I can't tell you uh, quite honestly whether they're trying to stop it or just publicly saying they're trying to stop it or whether they're encouraging it or even supporting it. Uh, but that, that, those kind of belligerent statements, I mean, every time we have 
a peaceful exercise, the North considers it an act of war and says there's going to be massive retaliation, which obviously hasn't occurred. Uh, yes, sir. I just wanted some stats. Uh, you made some mention of uh, standing armies. Do you know, you mentioned the number of divisions that the North has in the South, and then how much of the troops we have, and then the Chinese standing army. Or if you could just give us a rough number. Well, okay. I have those figures with me. Let me, uh, find the best slide here. So I think I already mentioned the Republic of Korea has about 670,000, uh, 3 million in reserve. Uh, those reserves are not like our reserves. Mm -hmm. They're not trained. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, uh, ever since I've been in the reserve, I've trained anywhere from 30 uh, days to several months a year. They're lucky if they change, train like four or five days a year. Mm -hmm. I do have some, if you're interested, the questions about the basing for those who had been assigned to Korea and were wondering about bases. I have some unclassified slides on what uh, that transformation uh, will look like for our uh, post and station. I'm sorry, this is taking so long to find here. All right, now you know it's getting serious after bringing out the <laughs> All Okay, that slide just says where it's ranked. It doesn't tell me how many folks, but I do have that slide here. Okay, for the uh, People's Republic of China, and these are unclassified slides and just incorporates their whole basic Department of Defense. Uh, 1.6 million as far as a standing uh, military, that includes uh, everyone. Uh, Russia, 395,000. Uh, the uh, PRK, which is the North Korean, 1.2 million, and that's where most of our, over the years, most of our relief went, because we had no ability, once we sent rice or whatever humanitarian aid we sent to North Korea, they distributed it. They wouldn't allow our distribution system in the country. Uh, so most of it has gone first to their, uh, the, the military. Uh, Japan, I think I mentioned already, 38,000 U.S. forces, I'm not considering any Japanese forces. And well, th those are the main players, Taiwan, I won't get into. Just a sort of follow up with the robustness of the South Korean economy, uh, is there potential that they would actually fund? the entirety of the defense there, essentially, uh, I mean, not that we would be collaborating, you know, cooperating closely and, and want to maintain our independence through funding our own folks, but that the, uh, they have a lot to protect. They have a lot of uh, funds available in the, in the success of their economy. Do you, do you see that as possible? Well, I'm not, I'm not in the State Department, and that's yeah. way outside my lane. Uh, but uh, okay. I think uh, the funding has been very robust uh, with what to have us there. They've already uh, shelled out quite a bit. Whether we increase our force posture or reduce it eventually, uh, once they take the lead, uh, you know, conditions change uh, and funding arrangements likewise will change. Uh, 
you know, hopefully our economy is going to turn around sometime very soon, and uh, we'll be better able. Uh, and certainly when we're, uh, you know, we have a national interest in being, we have a national interest in the stability in that region. You know, a lot of our trade, a lot of our imports and exports flow through that region. We're very um, economically dependent uh, on keeping free flow of trade. Uh, in those regions. So it is in our national interest to fund our force structure there to help keep the peace. But as was raised earlier, whether it's the right amount or, or not, uh, you know, that's, that's for the politicians and Congress and the President to decide. Yes, sir? Yes, how do you perform these twice a year exercises that you uh, mentioned? How do I personally do it? Or Wait, Are you in charge of these exercises? I'm not in charge of it. it the, I'll kind of go over the force structure that's there. We have a UN command, triple hatted in the Combined Forces Command. The third hat is United States Forces Korea. Now that overarching command includes the Republic of Korea Armed Forces, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force. So we have a four-star general, General Thurman, that commands, he is the top guy, not only the Koreans, but all uh, U.S. forces, and allied forces as well, under the U.N. command. Subordinate to that command is 8th Army. You know, we have a fleet there, we have uh, Marine, uh, Marines presence there, uh, they have a soft presence there, so we, we're the Army. So I'm in 8th Army. That's you. Right. Uh, but as far as, you know, I, I don't command and control, nor does our command command and control the Marines or Air Force or Navy. Although, when, if we were to stand up that combined joint task force, we would. Mm -hmm. But we still would be subordinate uh, to combined forces command. Sure, I appreciate that response, but also, how does this exercise look? Is it a parade of, uh, of troops and equipment? Uh, it, there is very little maneuver force. There is some. I will tell you, as part of the exercise, we do some non-combatant evacuations up in the north. Uh, there are some maneuver uh, going on with um, rotary ring, naval maneuvers, um, fixed wing, very few forces out in the field. It's not like a Fort Irwin or, or a joint readiness training. You know, it's not an exercise where you maneuver brigade combat teams. But, for instance, I will name, we had the 18th Airborne Corps mm -hmm. headquarters come in from Fort Bragg. They stood up because they are part of, were part of the exercise. Some of the 82nd Airborne. Uh, fleet was there. We stand up, it's really a command and post exercise, so all of our um, wartime defensive positions, command and control nodes are robustly uh, stood up. Exposed. So for, for instance, we had, uh, just on the reserve side, we had 13 general officers participate in this exercise and then a number of reserve commands from across the country, and active commands, would send over either basically their headquarters elements to exercise. Mm -hmm. Does okay. that give you kind of an idea of what it looks like? So all the, uh, what I'm getting all the bunkers are, are full. We stand up field headquarters in different locations. Okay, so what I'm getting is that it's an exercise primarily for our military to understand how to direct we have partners in case from, of a, a, from Australia, New Zealand, mm -hmm. other countries come as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's probably, I don't know what the total number was this past uh, OT Focus Guardian, uh, but it, it's about 20 plus thousand that come to Korea for the exercise. Not a good time to visit. And it's very busy at the airport. And it goes on, the exercise itself is two weeks, but there's a, a week before, three weeks, and then a crisis 
week for those on Peninsula. So it's about a month long exercise, twice a year. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. Uh, the you're painting a very bleak picture of the whole thing, considering the, con the situation in our country right now, the amount of monies we owe and everything else. I don't think a lot of people are going to buy a lot of that. Now, you brought up a fact a, a few minutes ago about a lot of people were not sure about the atomic bomb that was dropped. Now, you are in a position to take a position on that and tell, and tell people. For instance, I'm fairly very close to that situation. And we would have, if we would have invaded, and we would have probably lost at least, they figure, 500,000 men, 500,000 American soldiers. Now, you're in a position over there where you stand up and you talk to people. These are things you should be bringing out so they know the difference. I'm very much in favor of the bomb because I know what would happen to American soldiers. And that's, a, that's a minimum. They even talked about a million people. Well, that. It, I mean, this, this was on Korea. And we didn't, I mean, our nuclear posture over there is something I can't talk about. Uh, I personally, having read history, I'm reading a, a hit globalization right now, uh, a book that, and I just within the last two days was on that portion uh, reading about the use of the atomic bombs. Quite frankly, Truman didn't give it a second thought. Of course, you know, we started building those bombs in 1939. And I heard the million figure. That's right. Uh, we didn't, you know, we never hit the mainland uh, of Japan or Luckily. any of their holy uh, uh, territory. Uh, and probably a million casualties is realistic. And those bombs ended. The first bomb didn't end it. That's why the second one was bomb dropped. Um, you know, the J Japanese were willing to fight to the death and were. Uh, they, you know, they talk about kamikazes. They still had planes in reserve, kamikazes, pilots in reserve. They're, it's a terrorist. They had about 8,000 uh, planes. But they also had uh, kamikaze ships. Not a whole lot talked about that. So they had a huge capacity to inflict death on any invading force. So. I don't question, uh, it's a horrible weapon, but in the period of time uh, that it was used, it, it made perfect sense. The other issue was, at the time, and it's not much discussed in that context, it only is discussed in the context of defeating the Japanese. You know, we were already starting the Cold War. You know, we were afraid at that time, the political climate was a big fear that the Russians, no one could have touched the Russians in Eastern Europe. If they wanted to break uh, with Britain and the U.S. at any point, they had the capacity to dominate in Europe. So there was some show of force with the dropping of those ultimate bombs uh, to signal uh, the Russians, uh, you know, we I had the bomb, they didn't. And so, I, there, you know, there were a lot of reasons why the bomb was the right it was used at the right time and place. Uh, the targets, they did the best they could to pick industrial targets the same way we had in Germany, you know, trying to break uh, the capacity to wage war of the Japanese people. Um, so I, I don't question it. I think. I know, but I bring the point up because you are in a position to make a statement because your people are listening to you and you pass it over very quickly. And then my second question would be. If, 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 if you're not painting a very nice picture, a gloomy picture. Now, like in Germany, we had East, and East Germany and West Germany. The wall came down, now we've got a unified country over there. Couldn't something come like that? Is it to our advantage to have a unification of the Korea? I don't know that much about it. I'm just uh, saying. Absolutely. So, you know, what I talked in was the danger of a resumption of hostilities. But there are other scenarios that there could be negotiated peace. Uh, uh, of reunification between the uh, nations, uh, uh, UN nations. Uh, there could be a collapse that could be very peacefully uh, reunified. Uh, there are different scenarios for eventually, I mean, this is a, if you look at the greater history of a unified Korea, this is a very small slice in time for them where they've been occupied and split. So they're very hopeful. Uh, to wait it out and become reunified again. So certainly I personally am very hopeful that it can be peaceably done. There are other scenarios uh, and certainly uh, that's what everyone hopes. 
let, let me give you a couple other thoughts that are around that issue. So, uh, it's part of the Sunshine Policy was the idea that if you do engage as brothers, you know, they have families in the North and South that still want to see each other. If you can get uh, trade together, if you can actually have joint um, industries together, you know, it's kind of start a slow melding of the governments. One of the hopes is that because right now the North is a bottomless pit of need. And just like East Germany, you know, East Germany wasn't rebuilt after the war. And most of, you know, Russia took uh, all the industrial equipment and, you know, they took their pound of flesh out of all those countries they occupied. Uh, the North is in dire economic straits. So, for instance, if there was a peaceful reunification today, the Republic of Korea would, would see an enormous burden economically, just as West Germany saw. It took about 10 years, really, to recover from absorbing East Germany. It would probably be as bad or worse uh, with uh, North Korea. So hopefully there, you know, some of what they've done to combine industry, to build the railroad, uh, will resume and actively grow where the North can actually start to come out from under uh, the tyranny of its Stalinist kind of government that's really just milked, uh, destroyed their industry and milked the people. Um, so there would be a tremendous debt, a tremendous need that the whole in international community would have to foot the bill to absorb the North and, you know, you know, end the starvation would be uh, a first, first step. Thank you. Three broad questions way beyond the military, I, you know, I'm supporting that Congress comes up with this, the uh, President comes up with our uh, diplomacy and how we engage other nations. You know, we are there, Eighth Army is there as a show of force in the region. We are there to be our boots on the ground for America to, to keep the peace, to deter further aggression. Um, that's what the military does there. Of course, we have to be very mindful of the politics, something that ended up sinking uh, MacArthur in the long run, and we can talk about that afterwards uh, if you want. So any last questions? I've kept you a very long time. Great questions. Again, I thank you all very much for, for having this forum. Yes, sir. Who's the best question. candidate for the uh, election, uh, militarily? <laughs> <laughs> There's an ad that the, uh, that the chief of staff of the Army has endorsed that shows a picture of a guy in uniform standing next to a candidate, and it says, don't be that guy. That's right. <laughs> we we are not partisan. We don't. We serve our nation. We are subordinate to civilian leadership. So especially in uniform, <laughs> I cannot tell you that. And I also tell you I didn't mention this, but if you don't know this about me already, uh, in my civilian career, I'm a Superior Court judge here. We are certainly not part partisan. We are another branch of government, and we can't get involved. The only kind of uh, election or can anything political uh, having to do with law or judges, we can get involved in. But anything outside of that, we have to be neutral and detached and independent. Thank you very much for your time. And we wanted to thank the Major General for coming with the Korean War Commemorative Point. So, no, thank, thank you, you so very much. much.